Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our January, January, no, we're December. Uh, but happy holidays, and thanks for coming in. Uh, we are the Inventors Association of Manhattan, and we're here to help you, inventors, startups, entrepreneurs, figure out some smarter ways to launch your products. Uh, whoever's been here before, is that an accurate description? Yeah, I need smarter ways, thank you. Uh, well, not that you're not smart, no, but, but it's smart smarter. Right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bruce Nutler. I'm the president of this uh, group. I've been coming for about four years or so and president for the past two. Uh, we, as I said, just want to help educate and empower uh, you to have a better journey. Uh, we are hosted here very kindly by Troutman and Sanders, and our host, Louis Del Judas, is in the back, as I can be, yeah, stand up and just say hello, please. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Everybody's all right today. Hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. Um, this is probably my favorite Monday of the month to host this thing. So I am a patent attorney. I've been practicing for a very long time. You can't tell by the gray hair. <laughs> it's not children. Um, so if you have any questions, you feel like you need to uh, reach out, feel free. There's other patent attorneys in the office that are professional members as well, but I'm always happy to help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So by the way, uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping things. If you have coats and you want to get rid of them, there's a coat closet right outside. And also uh, bathrooms are just to the right of the door you came in off the elevators. Um, we have a couple of other professional members here. Gordon, you want to stand up and say hello? Hi, uh, I'm an industrial designer and I like working with inventors, so I hope you'll call me. We do uh, product development, engineering, uh, documentation, all the stuff that you need to get done to get your product out the door. So if you're interested, please find me and talk with me. And we also have Justin Esker, who will be speaking next month. I will be. So uh, hi, everybody. Hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving. My name is Justin. I'm a, a mobile app developer. Uh, I help people make apps. I know everybody has a free idea for one. Yay! Uh, if you really think it's that good idea, come talk to me. I'll help you get it built. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Uh, and David Pistelski. Hi, everybody. David Pistelski. I'm an uh, intellectual property and patent attorney at Gerhardt Law, based in Summit, New Jersey. We just opened an office at Pot 5 Penn Plaza and uh, an office in Philadelphia as well recently. So we been expanding. We're an entrepreneurial and inventor friendly firm and um, um, having come from a large firm, it's uh, a totally different experience. So it's nice to work with people who are from that entrepreneurial mindset. So if you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you, David. So um, what we're all about is bringing you on a monthly basis some interesting speakers. Uh, it's not fair I get to find wonderful people like Jessica. Uh, and that's the first part of every meeting. This month was kind of interesting. Uh, after about four months in a row where we were oversold on Pitching Panel, which is where we would give an entrepreneur an opportunity to come up and speak about their products for exposure and feedback, this month we had none. So this is great though because, um, as I say, it's not fair that I get to do this job and meet interesting people like Jessica, who's gonna speak with us about her inventing journey and share with us her hidden surprise here. Uh, but I met Jessica through a mutual colleague, and I was really struck by not just the wisdom in how she invents, but the things she does invent, and the different strings and perspectives she pulls into all of that. And uh, I just don't want to steal any other thunder. And with that, I introduce you to Jessica Banks. Hi. So I'm going to start off with a little story. Um, and uh, I think it will give some grounding into what I think is really important often people, can everyone hear me? It's okay? Yeah. Um, important uh, aspect of the inventor's mind. And it, I often I had such a hard time labeling myself. Sometimes it depends who I'm talking about. They say, are you an artist, a designer, um, a roboticist, an inventor? And I think actually inventor is the thing that I'm most comfortable with because it it sort of seems the most vague but appropriate in that I feel like there are no boundaries in the world and that helps me a lot in this kind of perspective. So um, I owe a lot of this to my childhood so I'm going to tell a little story about that. Okay, so I'm six years old and uh, my bedroom is on the top floor of the house and there are three big windows facing out onto a suburban Wisconsin street. 
in front of my bed or across from my bed, there's a big uh, mirror that's hanging above my dresser. And it's bedtime and I'm floating. My nightgown is billowing around me. My pigtails are unfurled like wings. I'm not dreaming though, I'm jumping on my bed. So if I get high enough while I'm jumping on my bed, I can see my whole self in the mirror and I'm suspended in the air and reflected against the backdrop of the night sky. It's bedtime, I'm in my nightgown, right? And I'm convinced that if I do this every night, and if I can just log enough of these weightless moments, that I can be space princess for longer than anyone else on the planet. <laughs> now, <laughs> um, I to... All right. so I'm jumping on my bed, and I am becoming a space princess. <laughs> I grew up actually thinking that I was going to go into space and that I would be an astronaut. I wanted to fly the shuttle. Uh, in college, I majored in general physics and creative writing. Some people think this is kind of a contradiction. And I didn't understand this, uh, or the problem in that thinking, until one day I, in Quantum Physics 101, when we were talking about a particle in a box. It's one of those uh, models taught in quantum physics classes early on because it allows some insight into quantum effects without a whole lot of math. And suddenly, I had an unepiphany. This happens to me a lot. It's kind of like a very lackluster eureka <laughs> where I, I realize the implications of something that is actually totally obvious. But it's, it's impactful. And in this case, it was that there were no particles in boxes that and of course, like I knew this was a hypothetical uh, example illustrating differences between quant quantum and mechanical physics. But what I hadn't realized was that it was a creative writing example. And it was like a translation or an explanation of, of a phenomenon and a story that was written partially in numbers. So, at this moment, I, I felt very internally reconciled. And at the same time, so was all of art and physics and language and psychology. And it really, this is where it started that I realized that there were really no boundaries between all of these disciplines. And after college, my now uh, internally consistent self, consistent self, decided not to go into the military and therefore probably not go into space. After four years of wandering around Earth, wondering what I was gonna be doing on Earth, I ended up at uh, the Artificial Intelligence Program at MIT, and a PhD program. And that's where I uh, was in a humanoid robotics department. And I learned there that building humanoids was really more about finding out how humans were smart and about building smart machines. I also learned how to machine metal. And this, to me, was a complete rebirth of wonder. This is skipping ahead, sorry. Um, so uh, I, I learned how to machine metal and with very sharp tools, humongous tools that were way bigger than me, way faster, very loud. And the fact that I could manipulate metal and it could suggest that I could change anything. And it also meant that I could collaborate with a lot of the men around me who spent their formative childhoods breaking bones and building half pipes when I was trying to, to feather Barbie's hair, essentially, which doesn't work. Um, and, and this was like a really um, amazing feeling. It was extremely empowering. I, I learned, in, in essence, how to, how to use my hands again. So um, I, left the M I left MIT in the 24th grade um, with graduate degree, multiple graduate degrees in robotics and in probably an order of magnitude more hand tools than I had shoes and earrings, both of which come in pairs. Uh, and um, it's from this vantage point, I clearly did not learn how to use a clicker, that I decided to start a company. And the company is called Rock Paper Robot. 
We make uh, primarily kinetic or moving furniture and lighting, decor, other robotic installations. Now moving into some other things. So this is like everything from transforming and, and levitating tables, which are passive and, and require a human to do the movement, to uh, robotic chandeliers that can respond to the environment um, and other kinds of you know clocks that change around and things like this. So you can imagine that uh, it is sort of what you might find on, uh, on Judy Jetson's and Charles Beams's wedding registry. <coughs> So this company is based in uh, the notion that every bit of wonder is bound to an executable reality. I'm gonna say it again. Every bit of wonder is bound to an executable reality. Everything I design is based on a physics principle uh, with the goal of not only being functional, but also of inspiring awe. Basically, my target market is your limbic system. <coughs> this is our signature piece. It's called the float table. It's a levitating table. wooden cubes that are all levitating with respect to one another. Of course, wood can't be magnetized. There are repelling magnets in every adjacent face of the, um, of the table. Should we have to cover this one? Sure, we can look at it now. And it is held together by a system of flexible cables um, that keeps everything in equilibrium. So it's squishy wiggle around, but if you actually, do I have something heavy, like a book or something, um, if you actually distribute the weight of a big coffee table or some a coffee book on top of it, it's totally stable. And you could put a tray of um, glasses or liquid, whatever you need. Um, when I first made this table and I, I, I did a, a, my initial prototypes, a friend came up to me and he said, you should have used magnets. <laughs> <laughs> He's a smart guy too, and I said, and I was shocked, and I said, oh, I, I use magic, and I paid so much for that wizard from Craigslist, now I feel totally <laughs> gypped. Um, but at the same time, that was exactly the kind of response that I realized I want to elicit from people. The other really interesting thing about this is, is often I watch people come over to it and interact, and they see it, and they're like, oh, cool. Okay? And for a moment, and then they play with it, and they touch it, and then they walk away, and then something happens where their brain kind of takes over their manual uh, ability, as if, no, I didn't get that, right? <laughs> and, then so, and then, like, they walk backwards and check again, because sometimes people think they're springs, but then they realize they can't be. These are flexible cables, right? So they can't be holding it up. And it's actually, if anyone's thinking it's a tensegrity structure, it's actually not because there are no compression elements in there. Probably none of you were thinking that. Okay, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> now that I realize that. All right, let's go on to some other quick ones. Uh, this is another one of our designs. It's called a brag table. It's a big concrete diamond balancing on its point, but it is not concrete and it's not balancing. It's actually Corian and it's hanging. So it's an optical illusion and it wiggles and so it kind of looks a little precarious. Uh, we're gonna be doing some other kinds of finishes and putting it on a, um, 
combination lock so you can spin it and then one of the sides will open and you'll be able to use it as a fire safe. So that's another one. This is one of our chandeliers. It's called Gleam Chandelier. Um, this is a jumpy uh, animated gift but really the tape, really the light is uh, continuous and it can open and close in response to what's happening in the environment. So if you have a big party, the light is big. Let's see if we play it again. Nope. Um, so, uh, and we can do basically, once you uh, add a sensor feedback um, system and an actuation system to one of these lights, we can do anything. So it can respond to something you control on your phone, it can respond to other ambient light. Now we're really trying to figure out what's, what is the functionality there? What, what can we really add? I don't like to just slap technology on things because it's, it can tend to be a, a little bit superfluous. So um, it's, inter it's really uh, important to me that I, I integrate the technology with the beauty and the design. I got this now, <laughs> right at the very end. MIT guys, MIT, okay. Um, so uh, it might seem uh, like I build furniture, but um, really I, I believe that I try to fabricate awe. And I think this is the best way to get somebody to ask themselves questions about what you do and become and become memorable and make a memorable experience for someone by changing their brain. And um, again, my, my life model is very much my business model. And right now, at least, it's succeeding, which is that every bit of wonder is bound to an executable reality. And uh, I think if the world was easy and physics and, and how the world works was really obvious and if having a company around this was easy, then there actually would be no occasion for awe. And so there's something I think to celebrate in, uh, in the fact that there are difficulties in all these things that we do and it's a struggle, but it's also one of the greatest rewards and one of the greatest ways that humans can really connect with our own humanity. And I say you can take it from me because I am the world's longest living space princess. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of a short story um, about where I come from. But now I want to talk a little bit, that's um, chief space princess. Um, I want to talk a little bit about now where we are with the company and my process and, and take a lot of questions. I also want to fix my hair. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so recently in, uh, you know, there's a, it's very trendy right now to be a startup, right? It's, it's, there's a lot of things about me that are very trendy. I'm a girl in tech. I have a startup. I make hardware. The maker thing is really hip. And uh, this kind of concerns me because I know this is totally awkward, but this is exactly how my life goes. Um, but uh, there's um, there are a lot of things, you know, all of these trendy things I'm lucky about right now. But this is really my life, and I have to make sure that it is sustainable. And if this wave of trendiness and hipness ends, I need to be able to keep doing the thing that made me start this, which is to want to continuously make more and more products. I have a problem in that I'm very distracted. I get bored easily. Actually, I never get bored. I get tired of doing the same thing easily. Not great for having a business. <laughs> I'm not a great character. Um, but I, um, I did realize that when we first started, and you guys can come up and touch this after, um, when I first started making these tables, it was just because I, I wanted to. I just was like, can this happen? I, I want to make a cool thing. And I really had no plan about how to make it a sustainable thing. I didn't even understand that I needed it to be sustainable, right? And after I did this for a while, I started realizing, and we were starting to sell tables, all of the, 
all of the sales we got were from organic press. And I was like, oh, that's just how the world works. Make cool shit, and then people buy it, <laughs> right? It's like, great. Then I realized, you know what's happening? I'm essentially, I make something, and then I wait for a client, and then they call, and I hire the cheapest person to make it, myself, and, uh, and then I wait again. I was a freelancer, and I, yet I had a product-based company, and this is a very bad business model. So I realized that I needed to uh, start to make money when I was sleeping. And in order to do that, I had to kind of reassess the things that I wanted to make and um, rethink what my approach was to having a company that would enable me to keep making more and more stuff. So I looked at now what I understood is, is a luxury market, also the, fur the furniture genre, and realized that I had all of these parameters, this huge matrix against which I could analyze each new design to see you know, what is the market strategy? Do I understand the demographic who will buy it? Do I understand the price points? Do I understand how it will scale? Even do I um, you know, understand what the user or the, the buyer's perception is of my work? And all of these things now, about 40 different parts of this matrix, I look at every time I come up with something new and want to try to bring it into the business. Recently, um, uh, and I have a lot of friends who are entrepreneurs, and I think I, I got a little bit of the bug of that too, right? And I recently uh, raised a seed round. It's hard for a hardware company to, to do this, especially <coughs> one um, that makes furniture, and that also you know, seems like their only sales are one thing, and it's very much in the luxury market. Our next table, which I didn't put pictures on because we're just going through the IP, which we can address later, um, is, uh, is our first mass market product. It's a table that will slide down from the wall and come out to any length, kind of like a reverse garage door. And so it's great, uh, highly versatile, great for small spaces, but really, and this is something that I learned as I was pitching myself to uh, investors, I learned that I wasn't actually a furniture maker or a furniture company. And that the minute that I said that to someone, I, I could see in their face that it was like chair table, like couch <laughs> was happening, right? And that that wasn't a good way to pitch myself. So more reading and more research and, and really trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And there are a lot of trends now in terms of um, people buying experiences. And I think that's what we do. For me now, and, and, I, and I truly think because there are so many experiences now that we can start to have that now I try to deliver experience through product. I create the verbs now in noun form. And I try to encapsulate moments where you can feel an intense amount of ownership and an extension of your personality and expression through something, but that it can also allow you to have many different experiences with it in the world. This table, and I'll be the first to admit that this is a completely superfluous item. I mean, <laughs> granted, you know, all art and culture, not superfluous, but um, you know, with this, you can even kind of push it in on something right now and change the shape of it. You can, when you put different things on it, you can kind of, you know, make it, feel like it has a different sort of personality. Um, and, uh, but it's still like kind of super, superfluous. So now I look at things and I say, okay, how much functionality can I add to people? And sometimes with this new table especially, how do I make a table that's not a table sometimes, mm -hmm. that disappears? Because there's a tremendous amount of real estate that we have in our world that is taken up by static objects, which doesn't make sense. Then the thinking about all of this started to transform into how are we really going to be using spaces in the future? How are we going to be living and working? And what is the use of having all of these open spaces, conference rooms and stuff that are so often empty, but can actually, you know, if we just put different things inside of them, can, can be all kinds of, um, I'll, they can really satisfy a lot of different experiences for many people. Maybe if Starbucks had the new table, 
right? At night, they could pick them up and they could um, have yoga classes. Maybe this suggests a whole new way of thinking about how people, um, you know, different revenue models about space and about urbanization and um, use cases. And so this kind of thinking really helped me broaden what I was doing and what my pitch was. Um, the uh, actual uh, experience of raising money for me was horrifying. <laughs> and <laughs> there are a couple of reasons. First of all, I I generally have a really hard time explaining what I do. My brain or my head feels sort of like a swarm of locusts usually, right? <laughs> and uh, all clunking into each other. And then the minute I say something, I have another tangent. And, um, and so uh, I really had to start to hone what I wanted to say. There was a while when I worked in entertainment in between college and grad school. And sometimes I was a comedy scout. I worked for a talent management company. Right? And I actually managed a lot of really, uh, some of the best comedians in the city. I would go to these uh, talent shows, and, or these comedy shows, and I'd watch our clients, and I'd also scout for new people. And it seemed like every night, no matter, I would, I would go and I would see the same, the same set over and over again. And it was almost like they had this thing where every day it sounded like if you had never seen it before, they just came up with the joke or like it was an accident, right? And I was like, you know what? This is a performance. And even right now, this is a performance. And you guys are an audience and I have some kind of um, obligation to being entertaining as much as I do um, delivering a message. And that idea of audience really helped me when I started to sit down with investors. Um, another thing that really helped me, I would say, is that I, um, I shopped for investors. So um, I knew that I would, if I would have a, a better time if I started to find people who could also be clients. So they would be incentivized. So I looked at all the genres. I said, okay, I want to be in hospitality. I want to be in food and beverage. I want to talk to developers. And I actually went and I shopped for investors instead of just finding out the investors that existed and how I could access them. That was really important. And now that has enabled me to have much more sales and much more engagement. And not necessarily in a way that people are um, needing to, you know, have influence on my decisions, but they want to buy my stuff, and that's good. Um, some other kinds of things that I, uh, I learned during this investment process, I didn't know if it was because I'm a woman or an engineer, but I would talk to some investors, VCs, which we didn't end up taking VC money in the seed round, and I realized that even though I had done all my projections, and I, you know, I believed them to be true, and even very conservatively so, that I would falter when I would start to talk about numbers. And I was like, yeah, is that is that because I'm a girl? Or is that because I am an engineer and I somehow have this relationship with numbers that feels extremely honest. And when I say a number, I need to say that there's that I understand everything about it. And this is a fact. And I <laughs> I was having such a hard time and I would get up to and I would, my, I, my voice would start to crack and it would be horrible and then I'd get more nervous that I was going to have to talk about the financials. So I asked a friend of mine uh, how she did it and she said some of the, the smartest advice, she said, state your assumptions. I was like, oh, that is genius. Mm -hmm. So every time I went in, I was like, okay, given this, with this, with this, with this and this, here's what I see. And it came out just totally normally. And I thought that was another really, really important piece of advice for anyone who's looking, um, looking to raise money is to be able to convey something with confidence, to fake it till you make it. I mean, there are so many cliches now, and like nowadays, startups like write them in neon, which <laughs> kills me. Um, but uh, there are so many cliches, and they're totally right. Okay, totally. And I am like, cliche is anathema to me, right? I like to be the strangest, you know, cookie in the room and, you know, never do something normally, but totally, you know, fake it till you make it. If you are, um, are in there and you're just like, yeah, that's what, this is going to happen. You know, one thing that I saw 
actually I, I had been dating someone who had started a, an online dating site and uh, before when I was starting up a company okay one day he showed me his pitch deck and I was reading it and I said to him I think you have an extra zero here in your projections <laughs> He said he was going to have one billion people on his site within one year. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, no, you know, you, you have a typo. He's like, no. <laughs> He's like, yeah, no, you for sure you have a typo. He's like, no. I'm like, you can't believe that. And I was like, your investors can't believe that. And you know what the truth is? Nobody believes it. And nobody needs to. They just want to know that you think that you have big dreams and that you have the confidence to try to say that. And it's really a game. It's like a, it's everyone understands that it's like a kind of a, a play in there, right? And you're just assessing your character development, I guess. And that was really helpful to me. Um, let's see, I have, um, if you guys have questions, please blurt them out because I can just like keep pontificating on things that I uh, observed and learned and now know about having a company, um, which now, you know, I did this thing yesterday for American Express, and we're one of the companies, they're launching a new uh, business card, or, a, or about, their gold card is about growth, and so they said, we want you to be a face of growth, the growth card. I had to go talk about growth, and Amex, and growth, this is what we hear about all these companies growing, and it's like so much fanfare and, and celebration and coolness about this. And do you know that growth pretty much sucks at this stage? <laughs> it's not growth. It's very deceptive. It is inversely proportionate to your bank account. Um, but the thing about growth, and I think this is another important thing, is that um, it's more about your own growth. And uh, there are a couple of instances where I felt that very tangibly recently. One was I, uh, I read an article that Virgin had this policy on um, this no vacation policy, which means that take off as much time as you want. So I was like, cool. Does that scale for like, or does that downscale for a startup? Can we have that? So I thought about it. I like to take a lot of approaches. I'm like, okay, first of all, sure, that would be great. I'd want to work at a company that have that policy. Sounds awesome. And I know that I'd work my butt off all the time anyway. And then I thought about pancakes. I thought about IHOP. I was like, okay, I'm an IHOP. If someone serves me two pancakes, I'm going to eat two pancakes. If someone says, there's the buffet, and you have infinite pancakes, you probably eat one and a half pancakes. And this, to me, added this like logical side. And I think there are so many examples here of when the world logically, emotionally, and socially can tell you something that is scary then to implement, but it's true. And as, I think, inventors, many potentially engineers or science-oriented people, to remember that there is truth in the things that are logically compelling and that they work. And um, that to me, you know, saying, okay, I'm putting my money where my mouth is here. We have no, we have no vacation policy. You know, it's less we have to write in the staff handbook. By the way, you don't really need a staff handbook right away. When you have two people, you can kind of be like, don't do that. Um, but, <laughs> but there are a lot of times too I found that you know, I was like, no, we're a company now, we need a staff handbook. And then I, I like spent so much time trying to, you know, glom together many of my friends' staff handbooks, pick and choose from each thing, and um, kind of a waste of time at first. It comes in now, I mean, we've just tripled in the last couple of months, right? So um, you do need it, and people kind of need that. It's easy to triple when you start with two people, um, <laughs> but <laughs> it's still a lot. Um, but, uh, this points to another thing, which is that it's, I think, very easy to get trapped in logistics and the notion of what you think you should be doing, but it doesn't make sense, and it's a total waste of time. It might, like, make you feel like you have some more validation and that you're becoming a company. A lot of people spend so much time on their business cards, right, and their logos, but there are so many ways to get trapped. I spent so much time, to, time trying to figure out like a contact management system, it was ridiculous. I probably wasted a year 
I'm just like all of these little things where I should have delegated. And that's another big, big thing, which is an, an, another cliche, delegate, delegate, delegate. First of all, there are people who will do it better than you can, even though you think you have the most intimate relationship with every idea of your company. It can be communicated, I promise. But um, there are people who love it and will do it better. And that's what really you need to do when you have a company. You have to find the people that do it better than you. And the people who love it will do it better. And I hate logistics like this. As much as I might love money like and, and even numbers and spreadsheets, I love a good spreadsheet with like tons of different like, references. I shouldn't be doing this, right? And, um, and that's another really, that was a really important kind of uh, lesson that I learned. Um, another thing about me is um, I hate making decisions. And when you have a company, you have to make a lot of decisions very quickly. So I decided that I would reframe the definition of a decision. <laughs> and now I look at it more like um, an action I take in which I'm tightly coupled to a reaction. <laughs> and that kind of mentality also really helped me. You know, just act and then believe in yourself to fix it. This is another way to hire people. Everyone is going to screw up just as much as I do. And it's and you know people say it's really really important to um, to hire and fire fast but and to find and build this culture which we can talk about but what I think is even more important is be extremely explicit and vocal <coughs> not just look for the people that you believe will screw up and then be able to fix it and come to you but say to them I need you to screw up and fix it and I need you to come to me when it's really hard and Communicating that to people is really important. And I don't think I, I don't think people communicate enough of that with each other. Um, they just kind of assume. Um, let's see. This brings up another idea, I guess, about culture. Um, there are so many times where I hear all of these words like culture and disruptive and you know, in, innovative, even like all these words have become completely ambiguous and meaningless. And I would say avoid them. Completely avoid them. Never describe what you're doing in these words. Even though people you think want to hear them, they're not adding any information. So describe things differently and really. And um, <coughs> company culture is something where I might be totally inconsistent in many decisions or in many actions I make uh, all the time. You know, like, oh, we definitely need to do this as a priority. And I'm like, whoa, that was not a priority. Okay. But company culture is something that I think deserves a high degree of consistency because you have to hire and live um, based on a value system. I had um, another really interesting idea. You know, we did all these lawyer documents and I was like, holy crap, I have no idea what any of this means. And like, even if, if something happens, am I gonna be the one to say, hey, section this or whatever, no. Uh, but I realized that there was um, in our uh, kind of our employment uh, um, descriptions and, and our offer letters, there are uh, non-compete clauses. And um, I realized that I was trying to hire experts in fields, right? And I don't expect every relationship to last forever. But if I want someone to be an expert in their field and that's what I'm looking for, if they leave me, they need to compete in that field. They don't have to take my stuff and my ideas, but they definitely are going to end up in those in those um, in that profession. And I would want that from them. And so that was another way of saying, okay, you know what? There's there's nothing about that in in these documents anymore. Um, and these kinds of things, I think, were beyond any time where people are like, you're growing, you're hiring, you know, and we are actually trying to increase now our output a thousand times in the next year. Um, but those instances of vacation policy and of, uh, you know, non-compete clauses were the times where I was really growing. And those are not the times that make all, you know, the press but they're the times that are gonna help you get to the next stage. So 
but I think that's really important. Jessica, I have a question. Yeah. You know, with all this great growth that you're going through, and you have the new people, what was the first hire, and what was the biggest gap you filled because you have this enormous mm. breadth of talents, and how do you help people figure out what they're missing? Great question. First hire, Pete. He is our head of fabrication. Oh my, this is annoying. I'm just gonna fix it right now. Um, <laughs> okay, guys, question and answer. Um, so uh, we, um, Pete is a, um, he's a head of fabrication, master woodworker. And I uh, totally upped my ante on the quality of products that I did and the speed. And he does a lot of the prototyping now, which is really great. And um, he's a Buddhist, which is interesting. <laughs> and I found that uh, one of the one of the, he would like talk to me about this. And one of the most interesting things that I was doing, I realized, was that every time I walked to work, I'd go pizza Buddhist, pizza Buddhist, pizza Buddhist, <laughs> pizza Buddhist. It sounds like pizza Buddhist, right? Like a kind of pizza. And then I realized I had my own mantra. <laughs> and every time I walked to work, what comforted me and what kind of set me into a mindset of being not a stress ball was that I had a pizza Buddhist. <laughs> and, and so, you know, and there, and these are also the ways that like these people affect the job, right? They affect everything. And it's, um, so he was a first hire. And um, then I hired an assistant, crazy, right? Um, I know probably a lot of you have had an assistant, and to me, like, I, I used to be someone's assistant. I used to be Al Franken's personal assistant. And uh, I never thought when I was doing that, I was like, no one's ever gonna be my assistant. I'm way too good, right? I was like, I'm way too neurotic. I'm way too anal about everything, detail-oriented. And found somebody who is um, perhaps more neurotic than I am. <laughs> and it changed my life. I, I can't even tell you, like, so freeing to do so much other stuff, and she loves it, you know? She loves it. And uh, that, that was a huge, huge um, thing in my life. Um, it's funny, though, because sal salaries are funny, right? And salaries in startups are funny. First of all, and pardon me for insulting anyone, I do most of the time, but um, I, uh, I find that paying um, a lot of sales and marketing people more than paying an engineer, for instance, in my company, makes no sense. Even in many ways, it makes no sense. And uh, this is something that I grapple with and I try to change. And, um, and that's, you know, you have to find a different kind of person then that's gonna work for you and understand that um, I'm a company that I value a lot of different things, but that if it's about sales and you are selling the thing that someone else just helped me engineer, you would have nothing to sell if the engineer didn't exist. And that is really important to me. Same with assistant. Like, I couldn't get anything done if it wasn't, if it really wasn't for her now. And, um, so I think there's, you know, there's a weird salary thing happening, and it's not just a gender thing. It's a, it's like a title thing, and it's important to be able to maintain some kind of honesty, I, I think, in what you believe there. That's um, a great observation because <laughs> it's about culture and values within the company, right? Absolutely. People come in thinking about marketing is important. It's not going to make sense. Right. Um, you know, the let's see what some other things. Uh, can just tell you and then we can take uh, some questions. Often I realized that I was coming to work every day and I was like, I know exactly what I have to do today and I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> and that mentality, <laughs> that mentality is really bizarre, but it is what it is. And again, like these cliches, I'm like, what is happening to my brain, right? Um, it is what it is cliche or saying totally works, right? Because sometimes you just gotta roll with it, and that's fine. Um, the, let's see what else. Um, oh, balance. Nope. I basically, <laughs> <laughs> I 
uh, you know, everyone will be like, yes, I have to go to the gym, and I'm doing my yoga, and I'm like also like doing this class, and I'm having my company. What? Okay, I can't even. I'm one of these open Amex uh, form like they, uh, the companies that they support. I can't even write a like a paragraph on there because I'm so busy. I can't understand how a lot of people are, and. You know, it's it's a that's another interesting thing. But I would say don't begrudge not having balance. Eventually, it will come, and there are times when, you know, balance feels a little bit like an extreme, and so it is. Um, let's see. I have a couple of mottos that I say all the time. Besides, besides pizza Buddhist, um, one of them is use all the tools in the toolbox. This has probably been one of the greatest things that I um, have used in, in this entire process and in my life. There are times, and um, I'm saying this, there are times when I would go into a meeting with a VC and I would wear red lipstick. And it didn't matter. Like, if that was going to work and I thought that sometimes I had to wear red lipstick in a meeting with someone, screw it, right? Like, it's one of your tools in your toolbox. These are ways we all communicate with each other. And what is my end game? Is it trying to make some kind of other connection with a person or be memorable? Yeah. So, you know, I stopped being, you know, like, there were so few times I never wanted to play the woman card in, uh, I, you know, I was in physics and robotics and all these things. I never played the woman card. And even, like, kind of shied away from these things play every card. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay? But know your toolbox. Know, know what's in it. Know how to use these things and don't be ashamed to. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's an aphorism, but uh, I think it's important. Yeah? First of all, Jessica, I read your bio this morning and your presentation humbled your bio. So great presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Entertaining and otherwise. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I learned in things that I'm doing today and, and where I'm going is that, again, you've got to enjoy the journey, not the destination. It's when we put pressures upon ourselves to get things done and put time limitations on it that we don't enjoy our journey, number one, and number two, have problems accomplishing our goals. Absolutely. And with that in mind, I just want to mentioned Bruce Zutler. I'm sorry, Bruce, but you don't get up and talk about yourself. Um, we're all here because we either have product that we want to bring to market, we have ideas. Bruce is one of the more brilliant minds in terms of product development, in terms of bringing products to market, and, and what you need to do. So I just well, thank I you gotta give you, you have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I had a question, Jessica. Yeah. Um, and I remember when we first met, you had this uh, schizophrenia about uh, IP yeah. protection. No, not schizophrenia, <laughs> about IP protection. Uh, that you know things should be open, and now you actually believe that there is a strong purpose for IP. Can you talk about that a little yeah. bit, please? I used to give talks about not getting pens. Um, thank you, Webb, for recording everything. <laughs> so um, I... Um, I'm now, so this stuff, I don't have patent on. I kind of was like, I don't care. If someone steals it, like, hopefully I'll be the first out there to know it's me, and I'm not really going to mass produce this thing, and if someone makes it, they're going to make it so many times, and, you know, it's not going to be my thing. There are a lot of different ways that I had thought about um, what I disagreed about patents. I think historically they used to be great. Da Vinci started these things and stuff, and, and they protected it, a real inventor, and now there are. So, they, I think they hurt inventors often. They, you know, I saw this in academia a lot, um, in two different ways. Where you know, when people wouldn't share what they were, what they were learning and what they were talking about, and that didn't do anything for the progression of a field. And if we, um, so, and I think now the idea of patenting is kind of um, it can hurt progress, but at the same time because of um, the way businesses work. I also saw when I was at MIT some amazing inventions that didn't pursue patents, that could have changed the lives of um, 
third world country, people who needed prosthetic devices, and they didn't get it because a company wouldn't actually invest in something that couldn't have the patents and didn't get it. And that was tragic. So there are, there are multiple sides to this coin. There's also, I think, the personal side, which is um, really, am I, is my goal in the world to keep like watching out for patent infringement? No, I wanna make stuff. I wanna make more stuff and hopefully, and I believe this to be true, that I will be able to make another thing tomorrow. Yeah, it's gonna suck, okay? If, someone, if I see someone come along and steal it and, and, and remake it and make a lot of money, yeah, it's not gonna be the best day. But at the same time, maybe it's because of the nature of how I think and, and sort of the breadth of what, what I do that it's not gonna be the end of my world. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to cut you off, actually. Cut me off, go. <laughs> um, I a few, a, few, <laughs> a, a few things. Um, what uh, contact, what contact, contact management system did you decide on? <laughs> Zoho. We Which use, one? We use something called Zoho. Zoho. Not the best contact management, but it's also, it's like a lead, um, kind of being able to trace your leads and how much money comes from campaigns and things like that, so Zoho. If we want to talk software, favorite one of the day, Team Gantt. Um, Team Gantt is a software that lets you do project planning with dependencies so that when somebody stalls, you can see how this then translates and um, to a lot of other parts. And that's it. it's so important to understand the dependencies of, of big projects, especially when you're working with others. Um, what was the other thing? Something about patents. Does anyone have a question? I mean, yeah, just one more. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 uh, do you not consider yourself an inventor? I totally do. I and and actually, this the new table. What we're doing, we're getting a patent on. Okay. Yeah. And um, so we're working on it. You know, the, all the design patent, the utility patent. And at the same time, though, I think what's really important is like I we intend to sell this globally, right? Someone's gonna have it. And then it's not even, it's like the minute they get into their hands, then they go and make it. So once it's out in the world, make it. There are like, not so much you can do in those cases. And or, I mean, you can, but it's, you know, how labor intensive it is, right? Um, so what we do is we decided to actually go um, for a different strategy to protect IP, which is go B2B first. And so get a lot of pre-sales through very big B2B markets. And um, then we'll at least have some kind of foothold in many different places all over the world. And hopefully extensions, product extensions ready to go before um, they can. The new table actually is customizable so you can change out all the slats. Um, and you can update it in terms of your new, you instantly want like um, new advertising where you're having a party, you want to put mirrors or you want to have whiteboard for schools and things like that. So you can send away and then we send you new slats and so your whole surface changes and you can change it in and out. And so, you know, even doing partnerships with people like, like things with like Mattel for games or the NBA for sports figures. Um, our, uh, one of the, the main things I think about is that it's not so much um, a lifetime guarantee or lifetime warranty, but a lifestyle warranty. Mm -hmm. And it, I want everything to be able to change so that you can have it forever. Thank goodness for IKEA because they have given a new like definition to versatility, which is disposability. And that's not what I want. You know, I want something that you feel like you have all the time and you really it's versatile enough and, and real time versatility as well. Yeah. Did you have any sales before you like like how were you selling them basically? So we were only so out of all the products that we were making, only selling this. Online? Well how did you get Again, totally I have no idea. <laughs> so, they, um, <laughs> right, I was doing no marketing and no time. I had to build these by hand, right? And that's why I was kind of deceived. I was like, oh, I just make stuff, what do you buy? Um, but, you know, it's funny about that too because um, I think that there's a lot, of, a lot of the East Coast when it comes to hardware. Um, people are hardware averse in, to, for investing because they don't quite understand it. And yet, it's the most obvious business model. You make stuff and you sell it. 
right? And so, um, but uh, we were selling these tables. And but we were selling them direct, not through like another store. Yeah, like you know, we were on some high-end sites, but to be honest, and this is another thing about pricing, the psychology of pricing yeah. and definition. Um, I never really sold, maybe we sold one from some high-end site that we were on, but really, People who buy a very expensive table want to talk to the person who made it. Yeah. It makes, um, you know, it gets more visibility, but that's not where the sales came from for us. But um, did you have like one like article, like some magazine or somebody to tip it off to get people to look at this? So that's the part that was organic. I think we got a lot of press, um, again, because we're also in something called the New Lab. My um, office is in, in the Brooklyn New in the um, Navy Yard at a new development called the Brooklyn uh, the New Lab. And what's interesting is so um, about in 2007, a lot of friends of mine uh, we started a collective. Uh, we a lot of us went to MIT together, and we wanted sort of the same kind of culture in an entrepreneurial sense in New York. And so we decided to start a uh, collective together. We had no idea what that meant. Um, <laughs> anyway, we wanted to be able to collaborate and share tools. And um, so we formed this thing and it grew and grew and grew. And then half of us moved into the Navy Yard and half of us are still in uh, our old space in downtown Brooklyn. Um, but uh, the new lab gets a lot of visibility because there's a big development um, thing behind it. We're moving into an 80,000 square foot building in 2015 that will have an amazing shop, huge auditorium for talks, we can do some talks there, ever. Um, conferences we can teach, have exhibits, and uh, it gets a lot of press because it's also supported by the city. Um, and it's a big initiative, again, in terms of one of these trendy topics of manufacturing. They say, you know, it's supposed to be a national model for a sustainable industrial park. What do any of those words mean? You know, I, I um, and when I say that to people, now we work with the developers and they're amazing and actually investors, but to try to figure out, you know, what do you mean by the industry? You're not really gonna manufacture here, right? Like, it's gonna be a, a, a smaller scale manufacturing. We're not gonna be able to be so versatile. Um, also, what do you mean by sustainable? Revenue or like environmental or both, right? And where's the park? But anyway, um, <laughs> where are the rides? Anyway, so, um, but it is really good and we got a lot of people coming in through there and, and that gets a lot, of, um, a lot of attention. And, you know, it's, um, I think it's cool to be able to give uh, a lot, we get different kinds of press and I always, tell other friends when I got press to um, and make connections a lot too and that happens because of our group and we're very we're very close so and trusting. So do you rent this, like how do you get connected with that? Do you rent with the space there? Yeah, or? we rent. We rent. Like basically, it's kind of like a sort of a hardware incubator then or something? Or? It's, okay, it's different than that because they don't have any real equity unless they're an investor. Okay. But um, it's more of a consortium of many different uh, companies that and, and friends that work together and, and share ideas. And, and a lot of times people talk about co-working spaces now and how great they are and special and this and that. That's just working near each other. Um, <laughs> I think that um, what, uh, and it's very, very hard actually to it's very hard to form a group of people that can really work together on, on the same projects. Many people might have very, very complementary um, skill sets, but on a given product or project, it's really hard to value how much time and, how, and what you need. And so you have to have a very open way of looking at that. And you have to also have a very trusting community. We curate it. We say, you know, we have um, interviews and the majority of people have to vote to come in, or and a lot of it's word of mouth. So it's really about the people, I think. And there's IP all around that's very clear, you know? And you know, all my expensive tools are out, but you trust people, I guess. And that's, I think it's very different than just a co-working, and it's important. Good question yeah. here. I'm just curious, if I, if I was to drop my credit card or like a DVD in between there, would it like wipe it? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, people ask. New product idea. <laughs> Here's what I wouldn't do. Um, 
eyes wouldn't swipe your card there. Okay. I don't think it would do it. Actually, the, okay. like I wouldn't swipe it this direction. Oh, no. okay. <laughs> the magnets that are um, the magnets that are here are much more powerful than the side magnets sure. because they have to deal with gravity. Oh. And when you have a heavier magnet, it weighs more, and so you have to like keep calculating. Okay, what am I going to need up here? If I if I make this more rigid, I have to add more here. I have to add more here. I have to add more. And so it's kind of balanced. Um, I have also put my phone down and computer on it all the time, but I don't say I say like no running hard drives, no running children, <laughs> in our manual. Um, it does kind of suck to have to like get something out of there, but we we sell it with a cleaning a special cleaning stick and everything, <laughs> and gum on a little end of thing also. Um, <laughs> um, but uh. Yeah, so, um, and these, the, there's the other thing. So these cables, which is interesting about these cables, are such that they're at a particular angles here. Um, so there are three inch diameter magnets in the, the vertical. And if these magnets, they're around, so if they um, come more than half their, their diameter to one side, they'll connect on their sides. So these keep anything from moving more than more than half inches. In any direction. Can you see them? Huh? You can't. I mean, no, if you want to buy it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we're going to raffle it later. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, if you just, if, you, if I had a piece of glass on, I could probably sit on it because it would distribute. Um, you know, we never found out the price. Huh? You never found out the price. This is $10,000. Okay. It's far. And, um, which is hard, okay? So, yes, it's a piece of art, yeah. but people ask for discounts all the time. And they say, if I buy five, can I get a discount? <laughs> Someone did buy five one day, and I was like, he's like, I'll take five. And I thought he was being like, I'll take 10, sure you will. And then he actually paid for them. Um, but uh, one of the issues that we have is that it's hard to say this is functional art, but it's still a piece of furniture. Yeah. And we can make the same one. It wouldn't be exactly the same, they're still one-offs. But, you know, I said to someone the other day, I was like, if you bought five Picasso paintings, would you ask for a discount? <laughs> <laughs> and um, though, legitimately, they said they'd all be very different. You could probably, um, you know, if you have higher volume, you can reduce your costs. But the psychology of pricing, for at least the um, uh, luxury market is also extremely interesting. Some people won't buy it if they think it's less than a certain amount. That's right. And so you kind of have to balance uh, you know, what the pricing is and your cost of goods and then also what you, who, how many you think you can sell to. So. The lady's been patient yeah. with your yeah, question. I came a little late, but um, just a quick question. How do you figure out the price of a uh, Value Again, this is, it depends. So now luxury is a little bit different. Um, and now we actually are kind of um, struggling with the idea of what the brand is going to be like with our first mass produced products. Because you, you know, you don't want it to dilute the other stuff. Like you have Vera Wang and Simply Vera, right? Vera Wang never talks about coals on her site, right? But, um, but again, I'm not Vera Wang yet, right? So I don't know, if, do I risk dilution in, in what we do? This is something we're still trying to figure out. Um, but pricing is, um, I would say, you know, first about uh, analyzing the cost of the materials and the services that went into it and um, giving you a margin, and then there's the psychology margin of what other, of what your market is. So it's mostly market, market and people work with? Yeah, and so like, um, but for high-end stuff like this, people don't care, and they don't, like, if it's something I realize, you know, like a $30,000 table, people don't, sometimes they don't blink. We get a lot of sticker shock, right? A lot of sticker shock, and that's okay. But I'm like, hey, you just paid for like, you know, 24 grades of my uh, <laughs> school. Um, but, uh, you know, we're trying to shoot for the next product will be like within like retail 1500. And so it'll be a lot lower. And it also will satisfy many different pieces of furniture in your house. And also if you calculated the amount of real estate, that then you would save. So 
we can kind of like. An important part about pricing too, I might just add, is you have to understand what's your distribution channel going to look uh -huh. like. If you're selling through distributors or other middlemen, uh, don't just get you know fooled by you have a hundred dollar cost of goods and oh I could sell it for two hundred or it will sell to the consumer for 200. If you have to sell to a store, who's then gonna sell it to the consumer? You have to take that into account. So if $400 is too much for your market, you then have to throttle that and say maybe you need $50 cost of goods and figure out substitutions, so. Yeah, and and you know, at first I wasn't calculating in our own time building. Cause I was like, okay, people get salary and then, and that somehow seemed different, but now, all of that goes into figuring it out. And um, there's a lot of R&D that goes yeah. into this stuff, right? And that people don't see this when they, when they see the final product. And that can take years. And there's a lot of times when we're working on, you know, we've been working on this new table and we'll have, we must have had 60 different designs and at the end of the one day, it'll be like, yeah, throw that one out, move to a different one. And that can take so long and, um, it, that's that's a very you know, interesting part that has to go into it. Going back to your investors, you mentioned something about a, a convertible note that you offer to an investor. Can you describe what that is, and and, and and how much time did you have to spend with an accountant or an attorney to work that out? They're pretty um, normal. They're pretty stock, really. Um, and you can even find them online and, and then you if like basically I'll just give anyone mine if they want it. I'm like all for sharing, why spend another money? But um, you can um, uh, basically that says, okay, you're gonna give me some money and if at the end of as when this matures, um, sometimes you either have to pay the money back or you have that option or it just automatically convert, converts to some equity. And that equity will be, be based on the cap. Um, that you've decided like and so the cap will be some saying something like okay um, if you have a, um, I mean it basically says like I I'll let you we'll call this like the top top amount of the investment and of what your company can be in you know it won't be like more or less than that essentially I, I don't know if it's a good explanation they're very stock things and that and like even if you just read the simple Wikipedia things and then you look at what you just spent six thousand from your lawyer to do, kinda wanna stab yourself in the eye. <laughs> and the lawyers in the room would appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't charge six thousand dollars for a convertible note. <laughs> <laughs> My client used to have both of us. <laughs> <laughs> but also I would say friends and family are a great start. And until you really know I mean so another part, I, I do a lot of consulting for large companies and corporations, and they, they come to us and say, um, I have a product in any stage of the product life cycle, be it napkin sketch or funded, and they want to go to somewhere else in the product life cycle, even up to full-scale manufacturing. And so we'll um, vet the industrial design, the mechanical engineering, the electrical engineering, the go-to-market strategy, um, the competitive landscape, a very holistic view, and then be able to give them kind of an answer on this and um, you know someone said to me the other day they said well I was like what's your plan what do you want to do he said I want to make a lot of money I'm like great plan okay <laughs> and then we started talking and I was, he said um, oh wait no I don't want it to look cheap I was like okay we have to talk about what your goal is because now if you're telling me that your ego has something else in this that is going to conflict with your idea of potentially selling to little girls and having a viral product, which will make you a, a ton of money, that you know, we have to figure it out. And until you really know those answers, I would say don't raise money. Like you have to figure out what you need and, and it means really like looking at what your goal is. Um, and often, I, you know, and even my anchor investor said to me, too many people raise money. You probably don't need it. And it's okay. And then there's all those fears of like, I don't wanna give stuff away, I wanna own everything. Eh, you know, like own a lot, but you know, until you're really, when you're really successful, you're like, it's going to be because probably you've got some help and then you won't care. So, okay. Any other questions? Jessica, you said you love to, I guess, excuse me for the paraphrase, uh, deliver awe for an experience. 
what's your inspiration typically aside from like uh, shadows on a wall bouncing on bed <laughs> um a lot of people ask me this question and i have a hard time answering it because i think that when people are often asked to describe their creative process that they romanticize it and there's some wig historian um, recount of like some linearity that makes it seem like ah oh, it was wonderful and, and it really <laughs> really like I'm, I'm I have a lot of writing on my hands you know and I like I look around and I'm like oh it's a really cool way that shadows happening I take a lot of pictures like I'll cut an avocado weird and be like that's interesting um, and um, I but I look at nature a lot and movement this I the first reason I came up with this someone showed me a magic trick about magnets and I was like, ah, that's cool. I bet I can, I could do something with that. And I could like, how do I deliver <coughs> that moment over and over and over again without having to do the magic trick over and over again? And that's when I started to think about, um, uh, you know, furniture. Yeah. How long did it take you from, again, that napkin drawing to, to a prototype? Um, again, like, I'm distracto. So <laughs> I and I had like. I, you know, started and stopped and did other things, but the, like a couple years for this, yeah. Um, things now are on a very faster time scale. Um, you know, the funny thing too, when I uh, I got to speak at this, uh, sounds really, a most powerful women's conference about a year ago, and uh, I met, I, I showed, I, I got to pitch to Warren, Buff, Warren Buffett, and I showed this table, right? And then later on at the dinner, I met a woman who said, I work for Starbucks. And I was like, oh, cool. You know, I didn't, I'm, sometimes I'm so stupid, I didn't get her card, or I really didn't ask, you know, whatever. I'm like, I knew she wasn't a barista because. <laughs> yeah. um, but I was like, that's so cool. And so uh, a month later, I got a call from head of store development that said, the president of Starbucks met you the other day. And um, <laughs> she said, we should talk to you, right? And it was that moment when I was like, B to B, right? And I had thought I was going to sell the customers before. And then I was like, ah, no, this is a different thing. And that makes a lot more sense for me. And so all of those occasions really, you know, helped formulate what I was doing. But it's been a, a really uh, kind of goal-oriented accident is what's happening. Yeah. If we were to follow you on social media, what how would we do that? Rock Paper Robot. Uh, there's Instagram and Facebook. Um, so Facebook. And I'm on it now. I'm just looking. Is it just Jessica? <laughs> there's Jessica Banks, but then there's at Rock Paper Robot is another. Is our and Twitter and I, I'm not like that good at this stuff. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. But yeah, you can find us. Yeah. Um, when, you just start, when you just started your company, were you working full time and doing your products on the side, or did you just jump right into it? So when I first started, I actually started in 2009. I formed an LLC, and I found someone who I wanted, oh, partnership, this is a good thing. So I, I found someone to start the company with. I'd never met someone who wanted to make kinetic furniture. I was like, we should be partners, and I didn't know how to do that, so we should have a company, right? It's like, seems odd. Um, formed an LLC. And at that time, I was a fellow at IBEAM, which is an art and technology center here in the city, and um, or just moved. And um, but I was living pretty much off savings. He had a he had a full time job, and it became really imbalanced because at the end of the day, he would be exhausted, and I'd be like, "This is what we got to do," and it was like I was the boss, and it didn't make sense. So back then, um, I was doing it full time, but I didn't know what I was doing. Okay, so I was like trying to make stuff, but I didn't know what I was having a company. Um, and then uh, it went dormant. We had the company, like we made stuff and I got so tired. We didn't do any marketing. We sh showed in shows. And then, um, and then I uh, decided I had another job and quit that. And then I started this up again and it has to be full time. Basically, you need to be totally desperate. Like you have to be scared. And I think if you're gonna make it work, people come to me and say the same, you know, like ask me, okay, I wanna quit my job, what should I do? And I say four months, okay, here's what's gonna happen. Make sure that you have four months of, um, you know, like earnings in the bank so that you can live. The first month you're gonna sleep a lot. The second month you're gonna start to churn around, you're gonna be like, oh, I have so much to do. 
third month, you are gonna panic and you're gonna be like, what was I doing the first month? And by the fourth month, you'll start to kind of know a little bit more what you're doing and you know, hopefully find some resources to be able to build something. But I think it's, it's really important to do it full time. Really important, yeah. So um, when you were a kid, you wanted to be an astronaut. And so what happened to that? Because you actually have the brain power to do it. And, and, and did you do, one, what happened to that? And then two, do you still want to go to space? I do. Yeah. I went back to MIT after working in entertainment because I still wanted to go to space. I thought I'm not going to fly the shuttle, but I could maybe be a mission specialist and, and build a robot. Um, I didn't go because after college, I met with my liaison officer and we were talking about um, what it would be like for Jess in the, in the Air Force. First of all, I was a quarter of an inch too short, so I stretched myself. I went back, met the height requirement, okay? And, um, and, but then I was asking questions like, well, what, what if I want to quit? I was like, Jess, like, no, you, you, these are, you know, you can't ask these questions. And my mom said, look at you, you're like a blonde haired, blue eyed Jewish girl with her nose pierced from Wisconsin. <laughs> you are, you know, like, you are not gonna like it. And um, I, I wasn't going to, I think, but I definitely still do. And for me, and maybe this is part of what I guess fuels me the whole idea of physics and, and the beauty of the universe, which, which I guess that's what inspires me. But um, I'm very, very comfortable with a tremendous sense of insignificance. And I think that that um, gives me some kind of like humility to try stuff. And the universe and space totally gave me that. Like an awe and insignificance. Yeah. Did you see Interstellar? What? Did you see Interstellar? No. No. I want your opinion on the robots. I didn't. I didn't see it. I, I have like I'm scared to see some of these things, you know. Sometimes I get scared to go to museums because I get so inspired, I panic. Right? Like, oh, it's so it's really cool. overload. Yeah, really, it is. Um, and I would say another thing about this is like a lot of times people say, oh, the, your business is your baby. And, the, and I would have to say, if businesses were babies, there would be no humans, okay? <laughs> they don't live very long, most of them. And so, um, but that's fine, right? These are like, in some ways, like engineering life challenges. And um, they will morph and, and I guess growth is just, Growth breaks things, but it's an amazing amount of change. Any other questions? Well, Jessica, thank you wow. very much.